it's natural to think of innovators and leaders as these incredible pioneers who changed the world or put a dent in the universe. Steve Jobs creating the iPhone or Alexander the Great building the greatest empire the world has ever known, etc. I would argue that we could look at things differently. Often great leaders can be considered release valves for an idea that was building up and waiting to happen. A fun angle on this exists when it comes to the topic of finding yourself, where I believe we also have a similar problem. We feel like there is some destiny within us and we're looking for the one version of ourself that works, who we really are. And I would argue that there are lots of potential versions of us that we could uncover and find if we wish to, and it's up to us to decide who we spend time being. So hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Psychology Podcast with me, Sam Webster, exploring the science of self-improvement and creating some food for thought that will help you build your own philosophy of a life well lived. In the episode today, we're going to be finding out about some of the commonalities behind what makes something or someone successful, from Hitler to Haribo, Jesus to Radiohead. I will be unpacking different ideas to give you a new way of thinking about success. And for those of us who like to wrestle with finding the point of our lives, well, you might get a few new moves that you can employ. All of that coming up after the break. I'd like to begin today's episode with the curious case of Confucius. He lived from 551 BC to 479 BC, and he was alive at exactly the same time as Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, 563 BC to 480 BC, if you care. And if you're into your historical figures, you might know that Socrates was alive just after them in 470 BC. And it does seem strange that the fathers of Stoicism, Buddhism, and Confucianism were all alive at such similar times. They produced relatively similar movements. They all focused on some morality, harmony, righteousness, sincerity. None of their movements were about a god as such. They instead taught the art of liberating yourself from unchecked emotions and reactivity, and perhaps most importantly, pursuing a path of wisdom. Now, sure, Buddhism does have some supernatural elements like karma and rebirth and can be considered a religion, but it does not teach the worshipping of any god. Anyway, the reason I'm pointing out that these people all lived at such a similar time is we focus so much on the teacher when actually what might be important is the curriculum. As individual teachers, Confucius, Socrates, the Buddha, they all had incredible insights and brilliant lessons, sure but it's easy to overlook that they taught a curriculum that wanted to be heard at that moment in time. If you release a new product too early to the market or too late, it will completely fail and fall flat. You could say that Confucius, the Buddha, etc. timed the market perfectly. There was an underlying craving to be satisfied. So perhaps instead of thinking of these men as incredible individuals who forged a path forward in morality and created these belief sects, we could instead think of the human population of that time period as having these beliefs already within them and enough people in society were seeking someone or an idea of someone to follow. We all know that with cognitive biases, people will click on an article with a title that confirms their beliefs. And these figures were the easy to click article of their day. People flocked to follow these leaders and their ideas because they already believed what the teacher was saying. Now, if you want to look into details, I'll agree that Socrates, Buddha, and Confucius may not have garnered complete public acceptance in their actual day, but they include a loyal set of disciples. Those disciples went forth, spread their message over generations to an increasingly eager audience over the next centuries as the myth and legend built. And as we compared teacher versus curriculum, we could compare leader versus faith and say much the same things about Jesus or Muhammad. I don't want to get into religious arguments here, but you could say that neither Jesus or Muhammad created the giant religions that sprung up behind them. It could be more accurate to say that they dismantled the floodgates for monotheistic religion to flow forwards. There was something shifting in the world at the times that they existed. The different pockets of civilization across the world were beginning to become more and more in touch with each other. It became increasingly obvious that the 
sun god, war god, and bread god in the valley next door with possibly just as bananas as the sun god, war god, and bread god in your valley. And people were searching for a more unifying theory that could begin where the science of the day ended. Faith across humanity was changing. And so it was not the leader who changed the faith, it was the changing faith that required a leader to follow. That leads me to the topic of lightning rods. When a storm cloud brews, there's potential electric energy with massive power that builds and builds and builds. It is going to strike the ground somewhere, regardless, but a tree, a building or a lightning rod will make the process easier for the energy to flow. And when a group of people have an underlying belief or need, it is these singular individuals or events that provide a lightning rod for that pent-up energy and need to flow forwards. So when you think of becoming an impactful person, it is actually like the art of becoming a lightning rod to unlock and reveal all the energy that is already pent up. You're not creating energy or needs. The needs already exist. From businesses to political movements or even violent events, In the UK, for example, there has been a brewing storm of far-right beliefs. When three children were killed in a stabbing attack on the 29th of July 2024, in the far-right circles, this was falsely claimed to be done by a Muslim asylum seeker. And there are actually some suggestions that Russia possibly helped stoke the storm by adding to this disinformation campaign. But who knows, maybe I've just been clicking on links that I'm set up to believe in. What is important is that in different cities across the UK, telegram groups and far-right personalities served as lightning rods to channel the growing Islamophobia, racism and anti-immigration believers, and it funneled them into civil unrest and riots. For a whole week, England suffered from racist attacks, arson and looting across the country. Now, it would be ridiculous to say that these riots created racism. Racism already existed, and some forms of it have been growing subtly through increased divisive content online, the ever-growing digital silos that people can exist in. The riots and the people who channeled them to occur, they merely withdrew the curtain to reveal the racist groups of people who were already there within the UK before. Now, yes, the people that organised the events did make the event happen, and if you're going to cause that violence, you should be sent to prison, but the potential and desire for violence was already there. And that leads us to the topic of whose idea is something. This leads me on to the next section of what is an idea and whose are these ideas anyway? Where do they come from? When Michelangelo was asked about how he carved the statue of David, he answered, it, it's very simple. I just remove everything that is not David. This is known as the idea of addition through subtraction, peeling away the elements that stop something from being itself. And I think in our quest to unlock our inner greatness, we can begin by looking in all the wrong places trying to add in all this different stuff when often we need to be taking things away. And one element of this is how we think about creativity and making things. Many of the greatest songwriters and authors don't feel they necessarily wrote some of their best pieces of work. Many say it was a process of uncovering it, that it was always there and needed to be let out. Often when I am noodling on the guitar, I might find an interesting chord and there's something about that chord that inspires me to write another chord that just sounds like it comes after that first one and then I'll find something else and before I know it I've written a song and that happened merely by stumbling onto a chord and then just unraveling the rest of the song that had to be what worked with what I first heard. It's sort of like completing a jigsaw. You place the pieces sequentially after the first corner piece is laid and the exact same thing is happening with this episode today that I have written. I started with a thought about inverting the idea of leaders to instead be people who reveal things and have simply been placing pieces in the puzzle as I go along. And so as humans, perhaps all we do is play a really intricate game of join the dots. You might think of that as a simple task to draw the lines between two dots to make a picture. But the true essence of all ideas ever is contained in the simple art of drawing connections between some different dots that are already out there. Notes and words that belong together in a song or concepts that belong together in a blog or book, they are all a bunch of different dots that get joined together at different levels of intricacy. The more clever an idea is, perhaps the less obvious the dots are to us that they belong together until the connection has been made for us. 
And I never thought of inventors, artists, or leaders as lightning rods before. But now that I've made the connection, I could see that it was always there. It was always waiting to be made. I didn't make it as such as find it. And science is probably the most obvious and pure form of joining the dots. Isaac Newton did not invent gravity any more than Einstein invented light or Darwin invented evolution. Those things all existed and did what they were doing before anyone worked out what the hell was going on. Isaac Newton, Einstein, Darwin, they were just the first people to understand that these forces existed and connect the dots that no one had been able to see before. And all inventors, hackers, hustlers are in the business of connecting dots. A scientist doesn't create truth any more than a business creates an opportunity. The opportunity is already there. Jeff Bezos did not invent the human desire for fast delivery of any item you can think of and find online with an easy return process. Like He didn't invent that need, it already existed. Reed Hastings did not invent the human desire to watch films or TV shows on demand from your sofa without waiting for it to be on TV or without physically going to a store to rent it. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, they were just there at the right time to satisfy the underlying needs that were there waiting to be met. If they'd been 10 years earlier, they would have been too early. The infrastructure didn't exist. If they'd been 10 years later, they would have been too late. Someone else would have already got there. And you could say the exact same thing about Hitler or Haribo. And we can go back to looking at Confucius. If he was around a few hundred years earlier, there probably weren't enough of readily available ways for recording and sharing his message available compared to when he was around. And if he'd been around a few hundred years later, he'd probably have been coming after other wise teachers whose message had been recorded in that area where he lived. And there's clearly something about that time period around 500 BC, where Socrates, the Buddha, and Confucius were all able to have a mythology built up around them and become these legendary thinkers. So let's talk about jigsaw pieces falling into place. That one of my favorite bands is Radiohead and they have a song called Jigsaw Piece Falling Into Place. But that's not the song I want to talk about today. If you know much about Radiohead, they first became famous with their song Creep in 1993. And they had several incredibly crafted and respected albums, despite not so much success in the actual category of singles. Personally, one of my favorite Radiohead songs is a song called Nude that gives me such an immersive feeling of peace and being in a dream. It's hard to describe, but really love that song. And the story behind it is just as beautiful. Radiohead first wrote this song in 1997 and recorded it for their OK Computer album. It had a rock organ in it and the version was described as having quite a straight flow and it didn't make it to the album but they did sometimes play it live where it sounded a bit like this. It became one of their best known songs that hadn't been released. Three years later, as they were working on their next album, Kid A, in the year 2000, they came back to the song Nude and tried to re-record it and work out how to deliver that song on an album, but it didn't cut it, and they did the same thing again in 2003 for their album Hail to the Thief. Here's Tom York trying an acoustic version of the song in Japan. By trying some different versions, they still couldn't make it work. And Tom York, the lead singer, said he was genuinely considering asking Elvis Costello to record the song, feeling that Elvis Costello could do a better job and that Tom himself didn't have the courage. However, in 2006, nine years later, during an early session for their upcoming seventh album of In Rainbows, Colin Greenwood, the bassist, wrote a completely new bass line with a more flowing offbeat pulse. And 
It transformed the song from something that felt more straight into something that had more of a rhythmic flow. And with this new tone, the band tinkered around a little bit, they started playing it live again, and they finally managed to record it for their album in 2007. became their best-selling song since their first hit single, Creep, 15 years earlier. And Tom York has some interesting reflections on the whole project. He said when Nude was first written, it was too feminine, too high. But by the time they released it, he said he now enjoys it for exactly that same reason. Because it's a bit uncomfortable, a bit out of my range, and it's really difficult to do. And it brings something out in me. The lyrics used to feel intimate and sweet, but now it just feels like it makes so much more sense. And their producer, Nigel Godrich, who worked on every version of the song with them, had this to say about it. He said that songs have a window where they are really most alive and you have to capture it. Nude had somehow missed its window, but by reinventing the song, Radiohead were able to capture it again in a way that resonated for the people playing it. And he actually said that the song had not changed so much, only the performers. And I would agree, when you look back at those old versions of the song, I feel they were actually just as good and really more reflective of Radiohead in their different time periods. The one they released really reflected the more digital version of the sound that they were creating in the album that they released it in. And it sounds more like Tom York is finally the person comfortable and ready to deliver the song regularly. If you read the comments on any of the early versions of the song, a lot of Radiohead enthusiasts really like those early versions just as much, if not more so, than the final one that was released. So perhaps sometimes we stumble on ideas, but it's us ourselves who are not ready for it. So one way of interpreting the story is that Radiohead worked out what this song should be like until they finally got it right. But another way to perceive this is that the idea didn't actually change that much, and they became a band that was finally able to connect with it. We are going to have a quick pause for our sponsors, and then I will continue joining Dots Together for you to bring this all together after the break. And this leads us back into the conversation about how to complete puzzles. And you build a puzzle over time, piece by piece. And on the subject of callbacks, something really curious that I found between Confucius, the Buddha, Socrates, as well as Jesus and Mohammed, none of these leaders wrote down of their own words personally. They all sparked an idea with their words that will never truly know the precise original version of. Over the decades and centuries, different recordings of their lessons were created and written down and passed along. It's been said about Confucius that his teachings have been interpreted and reinterpreted, elaborated upon and expanded again and again by countless thinkers, writers and emperors. Some of these emperors imported fashionable ideas and practices from competing doctrines and faiths. And the Confucius of modern discourse is not the Confucius of the classical age, nor is he even the Confucius years ago. Gu Gang, the Chinese historian and folklorist, said that every age has its own Confucius, and in each age there are several different kinds of Confucius. He's a figure who continually changes according to whatever people of each age think or say about him. But most people are not aware of this, and they ultimately don't understand what the real face of Confucius is. The thing with these timeless characters is the mythology around them can morph and adapt to match the demands of the current era. They can become a permanent lightning rod for slight shifts and changes of ideas. The first piece of the puzzle was laid down by them within their lives, but the rest of the puzzle was put in place piece by piece by the generations of followers that came after them. So I'll start to bring this together. If we think of leaders as people who are actually revealing what a bunch of people actually want to know or desire, And every single human spends their life basically playing intricate games of join the dots. Where does that leave us with completing the puzzle of what to do with our own lives? 
Well, of course, it probably doesn't matter, but there is an important difference between forging something and revealing something. You can't turn rocks into gold with alchemy, but you can hack a bunch of rocks apart to find pieces of gold within them. Charlie Munger was a huge advocate of the inversion principle and the insights that you can find by using the opposite approach to what is first obvious to us. And when we think of forging a career, building a business, crafting a masterpiece, it's easy to assume that we are the creator. But I wonder if you would perhaps have a different approach if you considered yourself as a revealer, a connector. As Carl Jung said, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. So by all means, I think you should go forth with your life, have big ideas and try to channel them. There are forces and needs in the world that are waiting to be released and you could be the lightning rod. Why the hell not try it? But remember not to fool yourself into thinking that you are forging something when most often you are uncovering something. There are so many things out there that are ready to be uncovered. Great businesses, a great podcast idea, a great song, Or perhaps, like Radiohead, you already have the idea, but you need to work on yourself for a decade before you are ready to do the idea justice. Remember that ideas are just dots that are joined together. And the creator of the idea is one of those dots, like Radiohead performing nude or Jesus performing the Sermon on the Mount. It is really worth remembering how much potential there is naturally inside you. You are born with the complete capacity to be fluent in any language if you choose to truly study it and master that one language. You are born with the capacity to be a grade 8 musician on any instrument if you truly, truly practice it. Sure, for some people it's a lot harder than others, but the capacity is within you. The question is where you channel your efforts, and that will determine which sort of dots you can connect with and what sort of life you will have. So think of yourself less of a creator and realize that probably you're more of a connector. And on that, thank you so much for listening. If what I spoke about gave you some aha moments or you perhaps have a friend that loves Radiohead, Jesus or Haribo, then I'd be delighted if you could join the dots for me and connect this episode with that friend, aka please share the episode. Uh, Then if you would personally like to connect with me to ask a question, you can always email me at growthmindsetpodcast at gmail.com and I do reply to every email. Sometimes it takes a while, but I do reply. And you can book a free call on Wednesday afternoons, totally free. If for some strange reason you genuinely want to support the show and give me some money, you can, because I perhaps add value to your life, you can join the premium subscription for $5 a month and get ad-free listening as well as the Ask Me Anything feature private content, joining the Discord chat, and some of our co-working calls to get stuff done together. Alrighty, this episode was really fun, and please stay curious.